the December 10th motion, okay. but I want to proceed chronologically. On the 14th or the 15th, I believe, uh, Dino was at the CIA Photo Interpretation Headquarters, and uh, tell us about this film. That you I saw. was the Chief Information Officer of the National Photographic Interpretation Center. I prepared all the briefing boards and notes that were used by the director of the National Photographic Interpretation Center to brief the president. <clears throat> on the, we received the film on the 15th, and we found the first missile site, called Mr. Lundahl, the director, and he in turn then called Majority Bundy, because President Kennedy was campaigning in upstate New York. But then President Kennedy was brought back, and uh, on the morning of the 16th, he was briefed. Uh, before we get to the morning of the 16th, the, there were miles of these films, weren't there? I mean, it wasn't like well, it was 100 photographs. The U2 carries, carries 6,000 feet of film. And you had to look at all of it. And uh, our, we were interpreting the film, in other words, if you were to think about it, from the White House to the, to the Capitol building, if you imagine on your hands and knees with a, uh, with a magnifying glass. That's, that's the way it Let me talk about the, the October the 27th. No, 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 you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> we're gonna, we're proceeding chronologically. I want to, hear about the early days of, you know, the well, 15th, the 16th? The six, 16th, we found the missiles, and it was in the afternoon. Now, uh, the photo interpreter called me and said he needed support. And uh, so we went through, the first thing, you measured the missiles. They were 65 feet long. The question was, were they the SS-3 or the SS-4? And I had a book of all the parade photographs taken in the streets of Moscow. And I kept flipping through, and I, <coughs> when I flipped through the photographs of the SS-4 in the streets of Moscow, Vince Lorenzo said, that's it. So we called Mr. Lundahl, and so the first thing we had to do was negate the area. When was when was it not seen? And it was not seen on the last mission on August the 29th. Then Mr. Lund, it was about quitting time, and Mr. Lundahl said, keep at it. And we found the second site. And then we found the third site. And the next morning when Lundahl came in, he said uh, that he was going to go over to the White House and brief the president. When he briefed the president, the president turned to him and said, are you sure? Mr. Lundahl said, I'm as sure of this as a photo interpreter can be as sure of anything. And you must agree we have not led you astray on anything we've reported to you. And the president said, very well. He said, what do you need? He said, we needed more, more missions. And then we also at the time said we needed low altitude photography. We needed the, the Liu 2 photography so we could trace the development of the system day by day. And we needed the low altitude because we were having problems. That, for example, we had problems with Bobby Kennedy. Or he would come over and he, we knew that he was the eyes and ears of the president. In one case he said, it looks like somebody's digging a basement. How, how can you be so sure? And we said, well, we've seen these patterns before in, in the Soviet Union. We have seen the patterns down at Kapustin Yar, or we've seen the patterns uh, when they deployed the missiles. So we were sure of what we were doing. Then the question came up, how far can they hit? Well, we drew a line. We drew it, we ascribed lines, and of course we could hit, we could hit, uh, from Cuba, they could hit uh, Washington. And uh, a strange thing happened, Bobby Kennedy happened to come in and he, he pointed and he said, well, those goddamn things hit Oxford, Mississippi? <laughs> <laughs> so on the next map, I put Oxford on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's crazy, you know, and I don't know how many miles
was a film you got, but how many people are looking at that stuff? We had about 125 at the time. Now, but I want to talk a little bit about the military reaction to the missiles. And Harry Powers was shot down in May of 60. In, October, in August of 1960, we received the first bucket of film from a satellite. That December, we see that there's a, they had a horrible accident down at Turretown of the Soviet Cosmodrome. One of their missiles blew up on the pad and killed the head of the strategic rocket forces and about 100 engineers. Then in June, we blew the missile gap wide open. And now the military knew that they had a strategic superiority of at least 10 to 1, and later some of the Russians had admitted it was 15 to 1. And the military were, were critical of for the president. They felt that he had chickened out during the Bay of Pigs, and they were very uh, concerned about him. And they immediately wanted the showdown because for every Soviet bomber we had 10, for every missile, actually we had almost double that. So as a case now, especially with LeMay, he wanted the confrontation and the confrontation as soon as possible. Oh, yes. Uh, we had, we, had, we had used the U-2s uh, over uh, Germany. We used the, uh, we flew over all the satellite countries at the beginning, and, but uh, the great concern was, uh, was uh, that the Soviets might move on Germany. And uh, so they were being watched very carefully. Uh, we had, uh, we would fly the uh, Berlin corridor periodically, and uh, that was a that was a good window on on uh, East Germany, because we there were three divisions, there were a number of aircraft, uh, I mean airfields, both bomber and fighter. So, but we didn't see any indication at all that there was a uh, uh, that that Berlin that the Soviets were planning to move on Berlin. Let me put it that way. There was no indication from, from the uh, analysis of the photography of, of the corridor and, and, and other areas. Uh, no indication that the Russians were going to move on to Berlin. But the president's concern was the British, the unit, the American unit in, in uh, uh, it was called a tripwire division. In other words, if the Soviets would attack at that particular unit, then it'd be war. And we had an ambassador at that time uh, in West Germany that provided some good information. I covered that a little bit in my book. But you know, at, at the same time, no matter who we briefed, the Congress, they were against Kennedy. No matter uh, when we briefed the governors, they were against Kennedy. And the military were against Kennedy. Kennedy was pretty much alone during these when Lundahl came back after the, the briefing of the Congress, that was violent. They criticized Kennedy openly. When, when, what date was that? That was, a, that was the 22nd. The 20, uh, just before uh, Just before he went on the air. And then when they briefed the governors on the 27th, they were violent. I mean, uh, Rockefeller and, uh, and Brown, they felt that the blockade was a weak, uh, weak attempt at solving a crisis. So uh, all during this period, uh, when Lundo would come back, I'd say, how did it go? And, and he would say, my God, they're picking on him. In fact, Lundo felt very concerned about the president because he had taken a beating before he was going to go on the air. And Lundo felt that that maybe was a bad idea because uh, he, he was concerned about how the president was reacting, but then the president did react very well. But uh, all through this, Kennedy wasn't getting much support from, from anybody. We were looking for security. The Soviets had a pension for horizontal security. If you looked at any of the bases in the, in the USSR, you found one barrier after another. Many of the sites would have as many as seven or eight fences around them. 
And we was expecting some security to see that in, in Cuba. What happened was when the crisis ended, the, we expected the 40 missiles to go to the port first. There were vans went to the port. And when we put two and two together, the nuclear weapons were in these vans, nondescript vans, just like you would have a delivery van. And so uh, we didn't put two and two together that the, that the nuclear weapons were in the vans because there was no security, there was nothing to, to make them uh, transparent, so to speak. If we did, one of the things that we were looking for storage areas that could... Maxwell Taylor said that our, we had a killer chairman of the judge, judge had screwed. So therefore, we ought to find more missiles and more warheads. Well, where could they hide them? Well, they said, how about trying the centrales, the, the sugar processing sites that have large buildings? Well, we looked at that, we didn't. Then they said, well, check the caves. Maybe they're in the caves. And uh, fortunately, there was a good cave report that somebody had done years ago about Cuba. And we looked at all the entrances of the caves and tried to find security, and we couldn't find anything. But uh, uh, it, it, even, uh, I've worked with Boggs, uh, there, he, he found one site, I mean it was an ammunition site, and there's vans in it. But you look and there's no security, the gates are wide open. And uh, so, it, it's, a, it's a real mystery because in, in the Soviet Union, the nuclear weapons were stored in, in uh, multiple fences and multiple barriers around them. Even some of them had automatic weapons around them. We looked for, we thought maybe the, uh, that would be a signature, that there would be automatic weapons around wherever they had their nuclear weapons. We didn't find that either.